Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Lincoln Stein. I work here at uh, OACR, and I'm one of the um, principal investigators on the Reactome project. And Nia, can you show me how to advance? Yeah, you can just use the arrow keys. Okay. In theory. That's not doing nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. Just need it to select what? the screen. Oh, select the screen. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, so today we're going to talk about um, pathway and uh, network analysis, and uh, I'll give you a little bit of a soup to nuts um, uh, in introduction to the various uh, various uh, uh, basic and advanced forms of, of this work. So we're going to talk about the principles of um, pathway and network analysis, uh, where the data can, uh, comes from, how you can get it. Um, the various um, uh, differing approaches to uh, using data analysis and visualization of this data, um, and some applications of um, pathway enrichment analysis to what your appetites. So the main reason people want to do pathway analysis, um, as I'm sure you know at this point, is the dramatic data uh, reduction in the size of the uh, data set. Instead of trying to find patterns in thousands of genes, you have a small number of <clears throat> pathways, maybe numbering in, in the dozens. Um, by looking at uh, changes at the pathway level, you're, reduce it, you're increasing your statistical power by reducing the number of hypotheses hit, um, that you're performing. Um, you may be able to um, uh, find meaning in uh, the long tails of infrequent um, uh, changes in the data set. Uh, here I use the example of rare cancer mutations, but it could be anything like genes which are infrequently altered um, in your system. Uh, and the, 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 real, the, best, the real value of pathway analysis is that it gives you ready-made biological stories. So you can, it tells you um, uh, which biological functions have been altered uh, in your system and lets you develop hypotheses that you can then uh, then test. And it's a lot easier than dealing with hundreds of poorly annotated uh, uh, genes with obscure accession numbers and names. So um, this is a very broad, a pathway network analysis is a very broad term, encompasses many actually very different techniques um, here, I'm using it to describe any analytic technique that uses biological pathway or um, molecular network information to gain insights into an um, experimental system. It's rapidly evolving, and there are many approaches. Um, and in, in fact, over the last couple of months, I had to add a new section to this talk because of a whole new class of AI-based um, uh, uh, analytic techniques. So basically, um, uh, you only need two ingredients, two types of ingredients to uh, do pathway network analysis. You need a, a high throughput biological data set, such as a list of altered genes, proteins, or RNAs. It can come from proteomics, it can come from kinase screens, it can come from um, RNA seq or single cell RNA techniques. Um, but you need a, a large, um, a large uh, sample size, and hopefully a, um, a large number of, of perturbations of the system. And then you need a framework of pathway of annotated pathways and/or gene networks um, to work on. Now, the the basic difference between a pathway and a network um, is that uh, pathways are um, uh, uh, biological des descriptions of the biology of a series of reactions that occur in the cell or between cells and um, are the, the kind of the fully annotated biochemical pathways that people and models that people pu people publish in which you have um, uh, you have a react series of reactions which have the things that go in inputs which can be proteins or RNAs or lipids or whatnot, and a series of outputs, modified proteins, 
So a kinase reaction will take as an input a protein um, and a, um, uh, an ATP, and its output will be ADP and a phosphorylated protein. Um, these are great at telling biological stories, but it's hard to analyze over because it's a very it's very heterogeneous. You're dealing with many different macromolecules that are interacting with in complex ways. So network analysis is a simplified networks are a simplified view of the interactions among macromolecules in the body. Um, they have more of a genetic view, and so here we're looking at um, the uh, EGFR um, uh, signaling, the first few steps of uh, ligand binding to the receptor. On the left, you see the pathway view, and the right, you see the network view. And you can see that in the network view, everything looks rather uniform, and there are two types of, of arcs. There are activators and inhibitors, and that's a very simple model that's been built from the more complex bio, uh, biochemical model on the left. So um, uh, just as there are two different ways of representing pathways and networks, uh, there, are two different, there are different types of databases. So there, the older ones are pathway databases, um, which are uh, generally curated databases. They come out of the literature. Um, uh, human beings have reviewed uh, papers and have extracted biochemical reactions and put them into a database in a standardized format. Um, they give you the biochemical view of biological processes. They capture uh, cause and effect, and they have visualizations that we're familiar with, pathway diagrams. Um, the disadvantages are um, uh, this is very labor intensive and science does not understand all of cell biology, obviously. Uh, and so the genome is, is covered sparsely. At best, uh, pathway databases cover maybe half of the genome, probably not even that much. Uh, and because human beings are involved and it's coming out of the scientific literature, the definition of what a pathway is will vary from one database to the next, depending on our history and arbitrary decisions that uh, curators and, and people doing the experiments have made. So, you know, where does the GFR pathway begin and end? That's very subjective. Um, so the two biggest oh, um, accessible databases, uh, non-commercial databases, are uh, Reactome and KEG, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and they are both have similar data models. They're reaction network databases, um, which describe pathways as a series of series of linked reactions. I sort of described this earlier. Um, it, it's um, the fundamental unit um, uh, of these databases is the reaction. Reactions have inputs, which can be any macromolecule um, or or small molecule for that matter, and then it has a series of it has a series of outputs. And sometimes the inputs and outputs are related by a chemical modification, uh, a phosphorylation reaction, a cleavage reaction, a binding reaction. Or sometimes it can be more subtle, such as translocation from one cellular compartment to another. So, um, you know, ATP uh, outside the cell is not the same as ADP, ATP inside the cell. And then there are regulators which uh, uh, up and down regulate the, uh, the reaction. The older of these two is KEG, uh, a longstanding, I think it's a 30 year project. Uh, out of the uh, uh, University of Kyoto. It's a really large library of uh, genomes, uh, genes, proteins, pathways, and chemical compounds across hundreds of different species. Um, it, uh, it features a, um, uh, a resource called KEG Pathway, which is uh, a collection of manually drawn, um, quite attractive pathway maps um, that represent uh, um, uh, 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 various um, uh, pathways in metabolism, cellular processes, organismal systems, human diseases, and drug development. As you kind of see from this list, it's kind of arbitrary um, uh, chapters, but they work well. Um, 
the um, keg used to be completely open access, but in the last 10 years or so, it's becoming increasingly hard to access the underlying data. You basically now require an institutional subscription to uh, actually download the data set and do analysis across it. What you can do with it now is browse through it um, and, and uh, look, at, um, look at the maps. So here's a, what a typical uh, keg map looks like uh, representing uh, this, uh, the cell cycle. Um, one of the features of this is that each of the um, uh, molecular interactors uh, is described using a, um, um, a uniprote number. So it's well, it's a well known. And each arc is described using a, uh, an EC an enzyme catalytic um, uh, number. The project I work on is called Reactome. This is a 20 year old project, so it's not quite as old as Keg. Um, it is uh, completely open source and open access. In fact, uh, everything in Reactome is in the public domain. So that's made it widely used both in academia and industry because there's no licensing restrictions attached to it. Um, it's curated by a, a group of curators uh, located in Canada, the USA, uh, and uh, the UK, and sometimes in other parts of the world. We had a, a curator in Vietnam for many years. Um, and it is focuses um, uh, very strongly on human pathways. It doesn't attempt to cover all organisms. Um, and uh, it spans everything from metabolism to cell differentiation. Um, we have rigorous curation standards, everything in the database has a, is, has a citation in the primary literature, uh, and we have a review cycle where um, each, each curator's pathway gets reviewed by outside experts, um, PIs and uh, uh, senior postdocs, um, and uh, gets updated and brought up to date. Um, we do cross-references to other informatics databases, so when you look, see a protein or a gene, you know what it is unambiguously. And we provide a series of visualization and analysis tools that um, I'll talk about. So here is what the browser interface to Reactome looks like. Um, there is a search function that lets you find pathways by name, or you can search for a gene and find out what pathways it participates in. Um, it has a series of, I don't know if my cursor shows up here, no, okay. It has, um, uh, uh, at the upper level, there's a text description, which you probably can't read, and a nicely drawn uh, diet picture of the, uh, of the pathway. And then as you drill in, you get increasingly detailed until you get down to the, um, uh, to the biochemical pathway-like description. Uh, and you can continue to, um, uh, you can uh, 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 download this information in a variety of formats and load them into analytic tools. So any questions about that? So that's what pathway databases are basically basically look like. They use um, internally um, uh, both KEG and, and Reactome and other pathway databases use a, um, uh, a series of um, industry standard formats to, for describing uh, pathways, uh, including uh, biopacs and, and cell ML, which I will not get into, but they are re text representations. Okay, so um, now we'll turn to networks. So pathways capture only the, the, the well understood portion of biology, things that were, are understood enough to get it into the scientific literature. Um, and in particular, they don't capture any of the high throughput information like um, proteomic uh, pull down information, cell um, uh, uh, gene inter genetic interaction data, um, RNA. Uh, co-expression data and other other relationships where we know there's some relationship between genes or RNAs, but we don't know exactly what they are. So networks are more flexible. They can cover less well-understood relationships, including those genetic interactions, physical interactions, um, co-expression, uh, uh, go term sharing, or uh, concepts like adjacency and pathways. So network databases. Um, 
unlike uh, pathway databases, can be built automatically by uh, taking large published data sets, going to their supplementary files, downloading them and digesting them. Um, as a result, they have more extensive coverage of biological systems, uh, but the relationships and the underlying evidence that says that two proteins interact with each other, for example, is more tentative because it's coming from high throughput, noisy data. Um, there are many, many network uh, databases. Uh, there are uh, over 400 of them. Uh, three of the largest ones are, are, are BioGrid, Intact, and GeneMania, and the URLs for all of these are in your notes. Um, they, um, uh, uh, they have um, uh, tens of thousands of uh, genes in them. BioGrid has 89,000 genes and over 2 million interactions across 80 species. Intact has 143,000 interactors and uh, a million and a half interactions. Um, and uh, Gene Mania, which is uh, one of Gary Bader's projects, um, is a compendium of uh, uh, um, uh, 2.8 thousand, 2,800 um, networks that together represent 167,000 genes and 660 million interactions. So it is quite, quite large. Here's an example of how you would interact with one of the network databases. This is a, a screenshot from Intact. Um, I have typed in, I think, uh, TP53 as the example here. Uh, and it has pulled out everything that TP53 interacts with, either genetically or physically, um, in a series of, of, of high throughput experiments. P53 is in the middle of this hairball here. And everything that it's interacting with is uh, uh, surrounds it. You can expand this network and show interactors of the interactors, and slowly turn into a big uh, hairball that's very hard to uh, to uh, uh, to understand. To be frank, uh, Gene Mania actually has a similar interface, but it is more interactive and actually a lot of fun to use. You can select the type of network you want to look at. I want to look at genetic networks. I want to look at RNA co-expression networks. I want to look at physical interaction networks, or you can combine you can combine them. Uh, and then when you do a search for TP, uh, P53 in this example, which is in the middle, um, it shows you the uh, interactions that are supported by multiple lines of evidence. So you can tune this so that instead of showing you every genetic interaction that's ever been published, it shows you genetic interactions which are supported by other evidence, such as physical interactions. So you can tune the size of this network and increase the amount of evidence for interactions. And it has a very nice feature that lets you select one of these nodes and expand it to, to, see, other, to see other interactions. Okay. okay, so as soon as you're into networks, you really need to have um, uh, you need really need to have visualization to be able to um, uh, able to, to to work with these networks. Um, there are uh, a number of uh, visualization and analysis tools. The one I recommend is Cytoscape, another of Gary's projects. Um, it is uh, comes both in web and desktop versions pretty easy to install locally. Once you have it, you can run, um, uh, you can um, uh, download and install networks from a variety of sources by entering their URLs. And it has a very nice ecosystem of developers who developed a series of analysis tools. Uh, I'm gonna talk about gene set enrichment and other tools, and I think you've probably seen Cytos worked with Cytoscape already. So maybe I shouldn't, shouldn't even be saying this, but um, it is, uh, Everything that I'm going to talk about, you can do with, with one side escape plugin or another. Okay, so let's talk about how you analyze um, uh, 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 gene sets uh, using pathway uh, using pathway network analysis. Um, so uh, there are basically three different classes of algorithm that one can apply. Um, the the most basic one is uh, Gene set, um, gene set enrichment, uh, in which you have a, an experimental data set, 
in the canonical data set is a um, uh, is a RNA expression uh, analysis experiment in which you've say given a cell line a drug and some genes have gone up, some genes have gone down, and you want to know what biological processes have been affected. And the output of this will give you uh, a series a, a series of pathways or network groupings which um, um, are, are related to each other. And this is essentially uh, the question you want to ask from this is what biological processes have been altered um, in um, in this in this data set. And I, I keep saying cancer here because you, this was originally written for the cancer analysis uh, module and I've adapted it. So wherever you see cancer, if you don't work on cancer, just think whatever your disease, it replace it with whatever your, your uh, disease system is or uh, biological question you're working on. Okay, the second is um, uh, uh, de novo subnetwork construction and clustering. So here, um, I'm interested in discovering new pathways, new relationships among genes that uh, are revealed by my experiment that are not in one of the pre-labeled buckets of cellular processes. Um, and here, uh, you can ask questions like, um, you know, what are there new pathways in the in this system? Uh, are there, um, you know, differences from one cell to the next that are not that are not apparent? Uh, just looking at the gene list, but when I look at them in a pathway context, I see that there is a see that there is a pattern. And then the most uh, sophisticated um, uh, uh, advanced of these techniques is uh, modeling. Um, these are um, uh, these systems take the biological pathway or the network and turn it into a computable predictive model in which you can ask what if questions. Uh, what if I knock down this gene? Or what if I uh, uh, ubiquinate it? Um, what, will, what will happen to other genes in that pathway? Can I figure out, can I make the cell differentiate by knocking up, by overexpressing the gene, and these are uh, these are used um, in uh, a variety of applications, including drug including drug discovery. I want to make a cell. I want to find a synthetic lethal combination of genes. I know that in this cancer, this gene has a has a, a nonsense mutation, so it's no longer active. Can I find another gene in the pathway that I can target with a small molecule? that will uh, um, cause an essential, which will uh, downregulate an essential gene and cause that cell to die. So let's go over, we'll go over um, these, these three techniques. Also feel free to stop me if I'm either going too fast or too slow. So um, you've seen gene set enrichment, so this will be review. It's the most popular really the dominant form of pathway and network analysis. And uh, it has um, uh, uh, it has two subclasses. There's over-representation analysis, where uh, I am, uh, uh, you're asking, uh, you're looking for uh, more genes in a particular process category than you would uh, uh, expect by chance. Um, versus uh, functional functional class scoring, where you're ranking genes uh, according to the process that they participate in, and you're selecting uh, the ones which are um, uh, which are overrepresented in that functional class. These are very easy to perform uh, um, analyses. There are lots of tools to choose from, and statistics are are, are well worked out. So um, you know the you know, you're, you're, you can control the false discovery rate, and you can give and you can give it accurate significance testing. Um, the disadvantages of these um, of fixed gene set uh, enrichment analysis is that uh, there are many alternative gene sets that people use. You could use you can you can use any of the three gene ontology categories. You can use keg pathways. You can use reactome pathways. 
Uh, and in fact, there's an entire, uh, have, have you encountered MSIGDB yet? No? It's a, um, uh, it's a compendium um, af at uh, University of um, uh, Santa Cruz uh, of, signaling, of signaling pathways. And there are four or 500 different sets of gene sets that one can, one can use. So you have to select, select them and they're overlapping with each other. Uh, and one problem with treating biology as just big bags of genes is that you don't understand the relationships among, the, uh, among those genes. So you can say, say that cell cycle is, has been altered but exactly how why it's it's gone up the activity has gone up, but exactly why are you seeing uh, are you seeing that upregulation in the cell cell cycle? Here's an example from Reactome of uh, web based pathway enrichment analysis. Um, uh, it's a tool that you can access from the front page. Um, you cut and paste a list of of genes uh, and alternatively the, and uh, optionally uh, there um, some number associated with them, usually an expression value. Um, and it will um, uh, apply a, a gene set enrichment analysis to it and give you a, um, uh, an interactive diagram of, uh, um, of the cell with, uh, so this is a, um, uh, a Voronoi plot in which it's highlighted um, the pathways which are overrepresented, overrepresented, it, overrepresented in that um, uh, in your gene set, and then you can zoom down into it uh, until you get to the pathway level, and it will show you uh, in the colorized fashion uh, which genes were overrepresented and why they were overrepresented. Um, Many uh, uh, reactions are actually uh, use uh, complexes of multiple G proteins. And so that's why you see these boxes which are half filled in because your genes, your overrepresented uh, gene or the gene in your gene set you're interested in is one member of a multi-member complex. And at the bottom of this is a list of the, which you probably can't read, is a list of the um, pathways um, that are overrepresented and their p-values. Okay, so that's pathway enrichment analysis, which you've already done. Uh, de novo subnetwork co construction and clustering um, is, uh, is a different kettle of fish. Um, here you have a list of altered macromolecules, genes, proteins, or RNAs, and you apply them to a biological network. And instead of pulling out um, uh, overrepresented gene sets, it is doing a it is discovering topologically unlikely configurations of those um, uh, of those genes, proteins, or RNAs. That is, they are interacting with each other more frequently in that pathway in that network than you would expect to than you would expect to occur by chance. And so we'll then pull out those clusters of interacting genes, discard the ones which are randomly distributed, so it's removing some of the noise, and give you a series of gene interaction networks which are um, uh, which are biologically interesting in your in your system. And generally, these tools will also try to annotate those clusters using gene set enrichment analysis. So they'll take. Uh, Let's say you've given it 100 genes and it finds three clusters um, of 10 genes each. It will then take each of those clusters, do a gene set enrichment analysis against the gene ontology and try to label them. So you have a cluster that has something to do with uh, the proteasome, a cluster that has to do with ribogenesis and a cluster having to do with DNA replication. And then it's up to you to make sense of it. Uh, here is a, uh, I'll give you just an example from Reactome. One of our side projects is to develop a functional interaction network. Um, this was actually created by taking the curated portion of Reactome and then carefully adding a series of high throughput functional interactions from um, 
uh, uh, from uh, well annotated experiments uh, and then tune so our false positive rate would be less than 1%. And that's raised the, um, uh, that raised the coverage of reactome from about 50% to about 61%, which is, which is worth it. So here's an example of a very early um, experiment that we did, did with this to, to show the, um, uh, the, the utility of the functional interaction network. Um, so first of all, we did a, um, you know, we took our curated, just to recap recapitulate, we took the curated pathways, we added um, a, a bunch of uncurated uh, interaction uh, networks, and then using machine learning, uh, 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 developed the, uh, the functional interaction network with about 270,000 interactions in it. Okay, and then um, on a series of data sets, including a breast cancer data set, uh, we then use this to do subnetwork extraction and clustering. So here is an example uh, from uh, breast cancer in which we pulled out a series of subnetworks, um, all of which have um, uh, correspond to pathways known to be activated in breast cancer. Um, uh, and uh, uh, then we an then we annotated annotated those models, and this this workflow is a uh, um, is a plugin for Cytoscape that you can get if you want it. You can look for Reactome FI network plugin. And so uh, the next thing that we did to show the utility is we we discovered a biomarker for breast cancer survival. Um, so we looked at each of those sub networks one at a time. And we divided, uh, uh, and with a uh, data set of a few hundred breast cancer patients, we divided them into two groups, one in which the ex average expression level of genes in that subnetwork were high versus okay. ones patients in which this, the average expression level was low. And sure enough, when the expression is high, these patients had a much, um, uh, much worse survival curve. This is everybody here familiar with Kaplan Meier curves? Yeah. Okay, good. Very good. Um, and the interesting thing about this is it actually was able to partition uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancers very well. Patients who have high ER positive patients generally have much better prognosis than those who are ER negative or tr um, particularly triple negative groups. Um, and patients who have a high expression of this uh, uh, of this uh, submodule um, have pretty much the same prognosis as patients with triple negative breast cancers. So it would be actually a useful clinical tool. And the advantage of doing this on a data um, um, doing this on a subnetwork is we also have an explanation for why this is a good biomarker. If you look at the annotation of this submodule, the annotation is cell cycle M phase and Aurora kinase B signaling both of which are markers for um, uh, my mitotic activity, which confirms what we know about breast cancers, which the higher the mitotic activity, the worse the, prog the worse the prognosis, which is not always the rule in all cancers. So that's just one of many different um, network um, uh, extraction and clustering algorithms. Uh, Gene Mania offers a very nice interactive um, uh, version of this. Um, there are also uh, another popular algorithm is from Ben Raphael, uh, who's now at Princeton, called Hotnet. There's another cyt Cytoscape app called, uh, plugin called uh, Hypermodules, which is uh, uh, particularly well suited for combining, um, uh, for identifying biomarkers that, that predict clinical characteristics in patients. And there's the Reactome uh, Cytoscape app, to, app as well. Any questions? Okay, we're gonna talk about modeling now. <clears throat> so in this case, um, you're applying a list of altered genes, proteins, and RNAs to biological pathways, but instead of looking at it at the network base uh, as, as a uniform network, you're actually taking into account the fact that some of these, that genes and proteins and RNAs are different they interact with each other in very different ways. Um, 
and uh, there's complex by bi complex biology underlying these these abstract networks. Um, they uh, attempt to integrate those relationships together in order to yield lists of altered pathway based activities. Um, and pathway modeling is really a arm of systems biology. Um, the uh, there are multiple types of pathway-based modeling, and each one is suited for a different um, particular uh, particular type of problem. So if what you're working on is a metabolomics and you're primarily interested in small, mo small molecule metabolism, then uh, we go back 60 years and we're working with systems of partial differential equations which now because of large uh, compute capacity, you can actually do computations across hundreds of, interact of interacting molecules. Uh, so this is not my field, but people seem to use cell net analyzer a lot. Then for specifically for kinase cascades and signaling, particularly used in the drug industry, there are network flow models. Uh, an example is called NetForest. Um, which are models based on um, uh, kinase cascades and given binding constants and KMs um, will predict what happens when you phosphorylate a particular protein, what else will be phosphorylated, how will activities be, be affected. For transcriptional um, networks, there are a series of, um, of transcriptional regulatory models that have built, been built up from large RNA-seq data sets. Uh, the most common one in use is um, uh, from uh, uh, the Califano Lab at Columbia University. It's called Arachne. Um, uh, and then there are uh, it's more general. There are two more general uh, types of modeling systems. There are logic thing, uh, logic graphs, and probabilistic graph models, also known as PGMs, which take a pathway and then kind of capture the logic of up and down regulation interactions and attempt to infer what will happen down here when you affect something up there. Uh, and the advantage of these is that uh, you don't need binding constants and rate constants. You're not actually modeling the physical chemistry. You're treating the thing as a, as a flow diagram in a, uh, in, in a programming and then over the last year, there have been generated AI models, which threaten to, and I hope will, upend this whole, this whole system and will replace um, these specialized uh, modeling systems with uh, more, more general and accessible ones. So I'm going to talk about a couple examples here, um, just to give you a flavor. A flavor. So we'll talk about um, uh, the, the Boolean models. So in a Boolean models, essentially you start with a uh, detailed pathway description with all the biological relationships, um, and you uh, convert this into a uh, uh, into a model in which there are two types of connections between um, uh, the uh, uh, between the um, the nodes, the, uh, the the genes. We'll call them, we'll say they're genes can have positive relationships and negative relationships. And then there is math, which, um, uh, which deals with what happens when a positive and a negative relationship come into the same node, who, who wins out. Um, and then there's um, simulation software, which will, uh, will allow you to do what if experiments. Okay, is it not moving forward? There it is, okay. Um, then, uh, in the last year, um, generative AI has really changed the paradigm of how people work. Um, and, uh, uh, have allowed, uh, people to apply the technologies used in, um, uh, in chatbots to, um, uh, to the problem of pathway inference. And so let me explain how this how this works. So the large language models like GPT that we're familiar with were trained in, to do a very simple task. 
they're trained to predict um, uh, masked text. Uh, so the, um, uh, the way these models are trained is you take all the text on the internet, you break it into chunks, you randomly mask out uh, a, a word inside the, inside the text, and then you train the system with the masked text, text and the unmasked text to predict what was under the black bar. And somehow magically it learns all the relationships among words and all the languages of the world and can start generating uh, what sounds like intelligent, uh, intelligent text. Well, you can do exactly the same thing, but with gene networks. So you start with a large set of RNA sequencing experiments, and people particularly like to use single cell RNA-seq because you've got lots and lots and lots of data there. Um, and you, um, uh, you apply a perturbation, so you use a CRISPR uh, inhibition or activation to change the cell state. You use single cell sequencing to uh, record genes that go up, go down, or don't change. Uh, and then you present this data set to a large language model and you mask out one of the genes and you ask it to predict it. And over time, um, uh, after training, you end up with a system that's able to recognize all the myriad cell states that were in the data set and let you do those what if experiments. What if I perturb a gene that wasn't in the original training set? Can I, can I predict the output? Um, there, uh, over the last few months, uh, a bunch of these have come out. One of them is, most recent is uh, SCGPT for single cell uh, GPT came out from the Bo, from Bo Wang's group at the uh, at UHN. And this was trained on um, single cell RNA-seq from 33 million cells, so a fairly large data set. This describes um, the, the, uh, the training system where they started with um, single cell data, they did the masking, and then they did a series of to, uh, to learn the basic cell states. Uh, and then they did a, a series of fine tunes to train it to do specific tasks like cell type identification, perturbation prediction, um, uh, batch and batch correction. And what they ended up with is, um, so here is a, a UMAP um, of all the cell types that the system is able to identify. So it identified major cell types, intestinal epithelial cells, as well as a, lot, a number of subtypes that people had not observed before because there was this, they were subtle patterns. So this is sort of an incredible resource of cell types here that needs to be explored. And then when applied to the perturbation prediction, um, what we're seeing here are the, um, uh, they looked at a series of CRISPR experiments, two CRISPR experiments in this case, um, in which they knocked down a, a, a two different genes. And they're seeing, you're looking at pairs between um, the observed change in other genes versus the predicted change. And you can see that they actually, the system is actually quite good at predicting how a gene will, how a gene will change. So um, in, in, in both cases, um, you can use either a Boolean model or you can use one of the AI models to, um, to predict perturbations to identify cell states. And now the question is, um, does, and, and this is, was top of my mind uh, a couple of years ago, um, was, is all the work that we had done to, pre, um, uh, to curate the scientific literature and put it into human readable pathways, is that actually useful for anything? And, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, my group did a um, uh, did a study to ask the question of um, do curated pathways actually allow you to make biological predictions? And so, what we did at this, this point is um, uh, ask how well you can predict the downstream effects of knocking a gene up or down, uh, either by having uh, experts gazing at pathway diagrams. Uh, or using a, uh, uh, a, a uh, inference algorithm. In this case, we used a Boolean network because this is before the AI tools had appeared. 
So I just want to take you through this. It's kind of fun. So the first thing we did, we went to the literature. We, we selected 10 cancer-related pathways. And we went to the literature, and we collected from the literature experiments in which groups had knocked up or knocked down uh, a gene in the pathway and then done um, uh, and then done an assay downstream to look at the pathway activity. And we're, we weren't looking at RNA in this case. We were looking actually looking at protein-based enzymatic, acti enzymatic activities or process activities because it's one thing to predict RNA expression. It's another thing to actually predict how the cell is going to how the cell is going to respond. And we collected 4,968 pairs of upstream interventions and downstream responses. Okay. <clears throat> and then we, uh, we uh, did curation of 531 papers and found 847, uh, uh, you know, well-tested cases which had, rep which had replicated. So we have a gold standard set of perturbations. Okay, and then um, in a blind fashion, we did two experiments. One was we had reactome curators gaze at the pathway diagrams and try to figure out from what happened, what we, what we would predict the target gene would, would do. And we also applied a, a Boolean inference algorithm, one called MP Biopath, um, developed in my lab, to predict the effect of the perturbation. Uh, and then the next step is, uh, given those predictions from the, the curators and the empirical results from the scientific literature, um, what was uh, what was our uh, what was our success rate? So the good news is it's better than random. Uh, the predictive accuracy of the curators was eighty one percent. So eighty one percent of the time, if they said a gene went up, it went up. Um, the algorithm did almost as well, it did 75%. And in fact, it wasn't a statistically significant difference. And random guessing gives you 33%. When we looked in more detail at what the source of the errors was, um, it was primarily um, false negatives. That is, um, the curator predicted that, or the, uh, or the, um, the algorithm would predict that the target gene would not change, but empirically it did change. And when we dug into these cases, the vast majority of these were because there was something missing in the curated pathway. We had missed a gene or an arc or a reaction. Um, so the good news is that if they predicted a change, they were very likely to be correct. That was up in the nine. That was up in the ninety percent range. And and of course. What the implication of this is that Reacto needs more grant funding so that we can curate the rest of the biology and bring us up higher. Um, there was also a very nice co concordance between what the algorithm predicted and what the human predicted. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an area under the curve of um, uh, about 0.91, uh, which is really good. Um, and so since then we have gone and made Boolean mo models for each of the uh, each of our pathways, and we're looking to um, uh, to get that to get that published and apply it now. Okay, um, and um, now with the generative AI models, we really need to do the whole thing over again using one of uh, using one of those models to compare. So, the uh, kind of in summary, pathway analysis allows you to discover the biological processes hidden in large scale data sets. Uh, you've got lots of databases and tools to choose from. I've only given you a small sampling of them. Um, the curated pathway database are actually worthwhile and they've reached levels of completeness that allow you to accurately predict perturbations. And it's a very ripe field for machine learning. So uh, at the end, I've given you URLs and other resources to look at. And uh, I'm happy to answer questions.